The term open science refers to a range of scientific practices, but it also refers to a scientific reform movement which tries to establish these practices. Since more than a decade, numerous fields of the social, behavioral, and life sciences are engaged in what we can call a critical self-reflection. And this was triggered by the dramatically poor replicability of empirical claims in their published literature. And many observed since then uh, that these replica replicability related problems are rooted in widely established but faulty research practices. This observation has turned into a scientific reform movement which tries to establish open science practices in these fields. This reform movement chiefly consists in an effort to develop more rigorous scientific justification standards to increase the credibility of the published literature and to establish infrastructure and platforms to support the application of these novel standards. And although these envisioned reforms are mostly methodology related, the long-term consequences of these modifications have the potential to lead to some very fundamental changes, such as transforming the culture and organizational structure of scientific practice, for instance, on the question of whether it is individuals or teams that are to be funded. The science society relationship, for instance, how scientific results are to be uh, best disseminated. And even the scientists themselves, for instance, by rethinking uh, the academic promotion criteria. Thus, we can say that we can de we definitely need critical inquiries regarding the probable downstream social and political consequences this movement might have on science and uh, the academic establishment. A number of such critical papers have been written so far, and they examine the socio-political correlates of the scientific reform movement. And most of these papers, interestingly, make very similar claims about the open science reform movement. They say that the open science reforms are market-oriented, anti-labor, or neoliberal. They also say that the scientific reform movement is nothing but an extension of the status quo or a reproduction of the neoliberal ethos in science under new garments. So I have here a few quotes from uh, widely cited and well-read papers in this literature. Moraski says, for example, that the problematic research practices are but an ideological backdrop for the open science movement to better establish a neoliberal market and social organization. Miroski says that reform proposals to increase transparency reflect a deep distrust towards scientists and increasing efficiency is nothing but the neoliberal ideology robbing individuals of decision-making power and delegating it to the markets. Miroski also says that the crisis of faulty methods is invented, and this is in order to advertise a change in the academic business model. And to accomplish this, the reformers evoke the magic of the marketplace to displace centuries-old practices of science. Levin and Lionelli say that what drives the call for openness is financial efficiency concerns rather than epistemic considerations, because for reformers, the value of certain scientific practices uh, is defined in econom econ economic terms rather than epistemic terms. Lastly, Kalar points out that questions of labor are invisible in the reform proposals and the reformers proceed with a fantasy of work without workers. So we undertook a critical analysis of the, this critical literature in a paper with the same title, Is Open Science Neoliberal? And looked into whether this literature actually succeeds in providing the much needed analysis of the socio-political underpinnings of open science. But the critics find the focus of the science reform on methodology inadequate and mistaken. And in writing this paper, Is Open Science Neoliberal?, we agree that the methodological concerns do not exist in a normative vacuum. We can totally say that there are not many purely methodological issues, totally unconnected to how one conceives the nature and aims of scientific inquiry and how these fit into the broad, broader sociopolitical context of scientific practice. And we are also of the opinion that the scientific reform movement has had a relatively myopic vision of how the entrenched methodological habits in whole scientific fields can be broken and how novel, novel practices can be cultivated. Because this requires a deeper and realistic analysis of the social organization of science and the scientific ideologies that, that shape and maintain it, as well as the types of behaviors uh, it sanctions. So they are largely in agreement with the critics that a deeper understanding of the social organization of science is still lacking in the scientific reform movement. 
Such an ana analysis should go beyond delegating the responsibility to incentive structures or to research culture, both of which uh, arguably have become merely buzzwords that uh, hardly have any meanings beyond indicating what is obvious that the problem is systemic. But we set out to write this paper because we believe that this overarching narrative is substantially mistaken about two things. First, about the extent of the dependence of methodology on normative questions such as social values and political ideology. And second, in their observation that the reform proposals endorse, promote, or reproduce the neoliberal status quo in science. So I'll address these uh, two points one by one. Let's begin first with how they link methodological discussions to ideological issues. So methodology as practiced by scientists is certainly not an insular domain. It is possible to draw some connections between methodological practices on the one hand and ideologies on the other. However, the critics are wrong in assuming that the link between methodological issues and ideological values follows an immediate route and is as strong as they claim. Instead of an immediate and strong link, we can at best speak of a relationship that is variously mediated. And here in this figure, we illustrate the uh, complex interrelationships between methodological norms and practices, the goals and values of scientific inquiry, so scientific axiology, scientific policies and the institutional structure of science, and the broader sociopolitical values and ideas. So methodology comprises principles for evaluating the empirical support of scientific theories. So these can be mathematical formulas for generating scientific statements or general rules for data generation and evaluation. Second, the axiology is the domain of scientific goals and values that we want scientific claims to achieve or to manifest, such as explanation, prediction, novelty, observational accuracy, intersubjective testability, or generality. Scientific methodology is closely related to scientific axiology, but doesn't have an immediate, immediate relationship to other domains of meta-scientific analysis. Because the relationship between methodology and science policy or ideology is mediated, mediated by scientific axiology. So with which practices are positively evaluated, promoted, or disincentivized by scientific institutions and the broader sociopolitical dimension of science as an establishment. So methodological discussions do not directly imply what practices should be positively evaluated, promoted, or disincentivized by scientific institutions. Rather, they address which methods are better suited for which scientific aims. As a consequence, Proponents of the same methodological perspectives might diverge in their perspectives on axiology and science policy, or advocates of the same policies might sub sub subscribe to incompatible methodological perspectives. It is also possible for a methodological discussion to have no relevance whatsoever for science policy and the institutional structure of science, or a discussion of institutional reform to have no methodological implication. On the other hand, the broader sociopolitical dimension of science has no direct or immediate relevance for axiological and methodological questions. So the proponents of the same methodological perspectives or even the same scientific goals could substantially diverge in their sociopolitical perspectives on the institutional organization of academia and which problems deserve to be addressed by science policy. So the connection between political ideology and scientific methodology is open to various mediators and thereby can be established in a myriad of ways. As a consequence, it is close to meaningless to try to link any ideology such as neoliberalism to particular methodological perspectives. So as a consequence of the flexibility and complexity of these interrelations, the reform movement itself is not a monolith. There are various methodological and axiological trends in the movement, and there's also substantial diversity in proposals concerning science policy and institutional reform. The, the open science reform movement hosts too many different normative, normative tendencies to be summarized or characterized by a single adjective. Thus, I think we can clearly state that there cannot be an ideology of the scientific reform movement. I'll give two examples to illustrate this point. So the proposal of practicing peer registration and, and the various proposals to reform peer review. So peer registration is the practice of specifying your research plan in advance of your study and submitting it to your registry. 
So Nozick and colleagues suggest that the main function of pre-registration pre is to distinguish prediction from post-diction. So according to them, pre-registration is a preventive measure against various types of ad hoc reasoning, such as harking or p-hacking. From this perspective, the scientific value associated with the methodological practice of pre-registration is what we can call use novelty. According to the second group of authors, pre-registration is a methodological tool for preventing exploratory investigations from passing themselves as confirmatory tests. So the problem for these authors is that exploration differs from planned hypothesis testing and flexible analytical practices decrease a test's accuracy because they dramatically increase the chances of type 1 error or false positives. So type 1 error means that concluding results are statistically significant when in reality they came about purely by chance or because of unrelated factors. From this perspective, the scientific value associated with pre-registration is what we can call exactitude or, or accuracy. So according to uh, the third quote I have here, Larkins, pre-registration is for allowing others to transparently evaluate the capacity of a test to falsify a prediction. From this perspective, the scientific value associated with uh, the methodological practice of pre-registration is what we can call falsifiability. And we can illustrate how these different axiological interpretations of the same methodological practice translate into concrete science policy proposals, we can compare Nozick and colleagues with Larkins in terms of uh, to what extent these perspectives are in consonance with the proposal of introducing pre-registration badges. So open science badges are given in recognition of uh, scientific uh, open science uh, practices such as uh, pre-registration or data sharing. And these are thought by some to be a cost-effective way of incentivizing open science. So from the axiological perspective of Nozick and colleagues, it makes all the sense to use these badges for pre-registration because the existence of a pre-registered analysis plan is a very good criterion by itself for distinguishing use novel hypothesis tests from uh, others. Larkins, on the other hand, other hand, doesn't see such a value in the mere existence of a pre-registration because he conceptualizes it as a tool for allowing other researchers to evaluate falsifi falsifiability. Now my second example. The established practices of peer review have received serious criticism from the science reformers for failing to deliver scientific error detection and quality control. And these failings of peer review are identified by almost all authors in the scientific reform uh, literature in reference to similar or quite compatible axiological concerns. But proposals for changes in the science policy and the scientific institutions to remedy the shortcomings of the current or traditional peer review system are most varied. So I can mention in one breath uh, peer review, peer review, crowdsource review, published then review, the red team approach, and the 450 movement. So all these are very different uh, science policy proposals regarding what they see as the source of the problems with the current peer review uh, system and their vision of academic publication. And this is exactly where ideological influences kick in. For example, the idea of peer review, peer review strongly resembles the web rating sites whose main function is to protect consumers by allowing them to access a crowdsourced reputation metric. Therefore, it can be said to protect the consumers of scientific knowledge by introducing another layer of quality control. So crowdsource review envisions a more communitarian solution, resonating strong, strongly with the ideal of participatory democracy in science. The published then review model aims to abolish the gatekeeping function of peer review that sometimes can take the form of censorship in the current model. Thus, the published then review model can be said to adhere to a strong pro-free pro speech stance. The red team approach, on the other hand, envisions that scientists make an agreement with independent, independent experts to scrutinize their own research instead of or accompanying traditional peer review. So the red team market idea is indeed a pro-market solution to the problems of peer review, and it is one of the few policy proposals coming from the reform movement and somehow can be associated with platform capitalism.
So the 450 movement, on the other hand, problematizes the uncompensated or invisible labor of reviewers and suggests sending academic journals a contract whenever they request a review and asking them to pay the, the due price of the reviewers' efforts. So we can say that it is a, a very pro-labor proposal. So let me next turn to the claim that open science reform proposals are neoliberal in some sense. So I'll elaborate only on the last of these uh, argumentative strategies that you see here because of time constraints and because I think the third is the most uh, serious and uh, problematic of all. So a concrete application of the neoliberal perspective to the domain of science might be the belief that when organized in the form of deregulated markets, scientific fields are capable of maximizing and maintaining research quality. The exact meaning of deregulation might change depending on the particular domain. So the critics see an underlying tendency for neoliberal deregulation in the scientific reform movement, and they associate it with increasing the precarity of uh, academic labor, uh, with regard of economical concerns as the ultimate source of value, dehumanizing scientific criticisms, criticism by automatizing quality control with the help of computer technology, or reconfiguring the institutions and the nature of knowledge so as to better conform to market imperatives, or endorsement of platform capitalism. So the encompassing narrative in these criticisms is that the scientific reform movement imagines scientific production in a way that is akin to commercial production and envisages the, to improve its efficiency by rendering scientific inquiry transparent and open to automatized scrutiny by technological means and ignores the humanitarian costs of such a policy change, mostly due to its ideological commitments. Thus, the critics picture the reform movement as a neo neoliberal scheme where human subjectivity is brushed aside for the sake of efficiency, and all governance is left to technologically enhanced processes of self-regulation in the market. However, these critics might be deeply mistaken in their analogy between the new science envisaged by the reform movement and the neoliberal market, simply because their analyses are based solely on the commonality of some words like transparency, openness, and efficiency, with almost no regard to what they actually mean in the scientific reform context. What these critics miss, I think, is that the reform movement can largely be seen as an attempt to redefine these values. So on the left, you see a few quotations that justify the neoliberal ideology ascription on the basis of the prevalence of these terms in the reform literature. On the other hand, we can say uh, that transparency in the context of reform is not exposing labor to the scrutiny of the market's authority to maximize efficiency, but a measure against fraud and questionable research practices that are incentivized by the neoliberal credit economy of the current academia. Openness, on the other hand, is not a tool for mass data production and management using the tools of platform capitalism, but a measure against the privatization of the outcomes, the tools, or the materials of publicly funded research by corporations. Efficiency is not the vision of increasing productivity, often at the expense of scientific quality and the well-being of laborers, but a concern with uh, the alarming lack of credibility in the scientific literature, which turns vast public resources and human labor into outputs that serve career advan advancement much more than the accumulation of scientific knowledge. So the reformers understand by efficiency reducing the amount of scientific claims that lack sufficient theoretical, methodological, and evidential justification, which are consequently exceedingly uninformative. Secondly, the reformers view efficiency as a collective property of scientific inquiry in terms of increasing the level of coordination between scientific projects and pursuits so that uh, we don't perpetuate contested, sterile kinds of literature, but progress our scientific knowledge through systematic and informative studies. So both of these aims are in conflict with the consequences of the neoliberal understanding of efficiency. So the current conception of efficiency leads to standalone, novel, and bold claims that are publishable, although often insufficiently justified. And this serves to maximize only the profits of corporate science, science publishers. So instead of characterizing the whole reform movement by a single ideological stance, 
I think it is much more meaningful to examine particular policy proposals in order to analyze the sociopolitical backdrop of, of the reform. Let me lastly illustrate how we can do so by applying the model I have outlined in the beginning to a particular proposal, namely team science. In the paper, we examine other proposals too, and we have selected these examples, including team science, both because they are widely popular among reformers and that the critics of scientific reform point out these proposals as some obvious examples of reform being an appendage of neoliberalism. So an alternative inter interpretation of these policy proposals might be quite beneficial, as we tried to do. So the campaign for team science uh, advocates that various methodological problems that impede scientific progress can be tackled by cooperation among researchers and coordination of research projects. Big scale scientific collaboration can ser serve several methodological aims. For instance, in high energy physics, a large scale division of cognitive labor enables multiple cross checking mechanisms for error detection. In the social and behavioral sciences, a pertinent example is collaborative replication projects, which utilize multi site replication studies to increase statistical power or to check for possible confounding effects of experimental settings or population characteristics, or of researcher bias, or sample selection. As a science policy proposal, uh, big team science can be said to have a higher affinity with certain scientific values over others. For instance, it facilitates the use of resources to increase robustness, rigor, and reliability, while we can say that it penalizes novelty because it limits the number of individual research questions that can be investigated with the same amount of resources. Another distinguishing feature of team science is that unlike individual-centered traditional research model, it allows for plurality in theoretical and methodological practices to be applied in tackling complex questions. And regarding the broader sociopolitical values that shape the scientific ethos, team science promotes diversity in expertise and division of cognitive labor, while it, it diminishes the importance of eminence of, eminence, of eminent scientists. A most concrete sign of this is the practice of consortium or group authorship. So institutionally, large-scale collaborative, collaborative projects cannot proliferate within an academic culture that values the quantity of first-order publications and novel hypotheses and rapid, rapid results. Uh, Knorr Setina, for instance, on the basis of her obser observations of high energy physics experiments at CERN, described the new ethos demanded by collaborative research as post-traditional communitarianism, which is recognized by features such as collective ownership of scientific discovery, collective decision-making and responsibility, as, as well as free flow of information. A communitarian ethos also cultivates quite different qualities in individuals than uh, an individualist one. Within team science context, specialized technical skills and field knowledge must be accompanied by qualities that facilitate interpersonal cooperation, collective decision-making, and decentralized governance. So the current academic setting penalizes individual qualities that facilitate uh, cooperation and rewards those that serve competition, since the former do not directly contribute to measurable research outputs. So unlike the critics, we see little reason to associate team science with the neoliberal ethos. To wrap this all up, our examination of the published literature on reform criticism which associate the movement with the neoliberal status quo, led us to conclude that we need a much more nuanced, nuanced account of the sociopolitical underpinnings of the reform. This whole discussion is important as there is indeed a risk uh, in the movement towards reproducing or at least reaching a compromise with uh, that status quo. In the near future, the methodology and science policies changes envisioned by the reformers, such as pre-registration or open data sharing, could be completely gamified or assimilated by the problematic status quo, lose their soul as well as their rationale, and just become further ritual hurdles that researchers are expected to overcome in their competition for credit, awards, and promotions. So we need a sociopolitical analysis of the reform movement that show serious engagement with the reform movement, attention to major differences between uh, various trends in the movement, and diligent analyses of associations, associations between methodology, axiology, and science policy. Pessimistic overgeneralizations, which mostly depend on inaccurate observations, unfortunately cannot provide such a critical vision. I stop here and thank you for listening. And here is uh, the full reference to uh, the paper I've presented some parts of.